I really wanted to make sure that tonight, what I was highlighting was that we've got to get out of that mentality that just says, I'm just here to serve God. Yes, that is important. Yes, that is important for you to be able to grow. That is important for you to be intimate with God. Absolutely. But God puts man in front of you so that he can build you and grow you. Amen. Amen. I love this psalm. This is something for us to read. Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3. Come on now. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment poured on the head that ran down on the beard, even the beard of Aaron, the first high priest, that came down upon the collar and the skirts of his garments. Oh, my God. Consecrating the whole body. Wait, wait, wait. It says when we're in unity, it's like the precious ointment that is poured on the head, but it ran down the beard of who? Aaron. Who does Aaron represent? He, pre- he represents the high priest. He represents the head. Is he God? No, but he's the one who God set as the, as the priest. When we are connected with the vision of the set man of the house, the priest who, set, who is set over the house It is good and pleasant in the eyes of God. That anointing that goes on his beard, and we've heard about some of the teachings about uh, the the robe that the priest wears. That that anointing goes from his beard, and it goes down to his garments through the ephod. That that is the garment, it's the ephod. And at the very bottom, at the hem of his garment, is where the anointing rests and lays. If we will learn how to get under the anointing and under the authority of the set man of the house. You are right there where the anointing lays. You get more and more anointed because you get more of a double portion. Amen? It is good and pleasant when we dwell together in unity. When you sit at the feet of the one that God has placed over you, you reap the abundant anointing. Verse 3, it is like the dew of lofty Mount Hermon and the dew that comes on the hills of of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Whoa. This connection with the vision and the application of the vision commands the blessings of God. Romans 8, 19, it says this, for even the whole creation... All nature waits expectantly and longs earnestly for God's sons to be made known, waiting for the revealing, the disclosing of their sonship. Creation is waiting for us to get under that sonship. Creation is waiting for us to get under that sonship. Baltimore is waiting for us to get under that sonship. This house is waiting for us to get under that sonship. For us to see that increase, for us to see that abundance, we have to get under that sonship. Amen? Hmm. Who matures you? Who matures you? It's your covering. Your covering matures you. It's the man of God or the woman of God who you submit under. I joke a lot. I say that um, I finished uh, two years of CCSM. And uh, Bishop says, you're still in school, right? I was like, yep. Yep, it's like I never graduated. So I, I just say this, I say this now, I, I'll coin this. I, I just transitioned from ITS to BPS. I transitioned from intensive training school to Bishop Pierce School. Just transitioned, right? Because I know that what God's calling me to do is great. And for me to accomplish that, I must stay connected with the authority that he's placed me under. And your calling in God is great. But so many times we look at it from a little peephole that we can't see the big picture. Because it's just us trying to do it ourselves. But if we'll come under the authority, and if we'll submit ourselves and we'll open ourselves up, God can really open up the vast wonders of all that he wants to do into and through your very life. Amen? Amen. 
We need to do just as Jesus did. He did what he saw his father doing. Come on now. How many of you have been to heaven? Uh huh. Jesus obviously did, and he came on earth, right? And he gave us that picture I do what I see my father doing. Are you doing what you see your spiritual father doing? Are you? The blessings, there's a lot of blessings, guys. There's actually six of them that I wanted to highlight. The blessings of coming under someone and serving them. Number one, you don't have to fight the same battles because your covenant has already fought those battles for you. Good God Almighty. I hear what Bishop says about what it took for the church to get to this building, right? That seats over 3,000 people. But I know that God does not only want this church to be filled during eternity play. Right? I long and I long and I long, and we need to push for that day when we're just going to keep on seeing on Sundays more and more people being added to this house. Because he's already fought that battle of building the church, right? we got this church now, right? So he's fought that battle of building it. Who needs to fill it? Right? So that's our new battle, right? But when you come under a covering, there's some battles that you don't have to face because your covering tells you what they went through. And hopefully we'll listen to them and we won't and we won't have to go through those same issues and problems. I always wondered why my little brother got whooped a lot less than I did. When I was younger, man, I got whooped like prescription medication. You know, it was like one BID. If you're in the nursing field, you know that means twice a day. Right? TID sometimes came, but that was twice a day. If I already had it once a day, then I did good. And I was like, man, why in the world did my brother not get whooped the same way that I did? That boy told me later on, he said, you know why? I learned what you did wrong and I didn't do it. I was like, boy, you smart aleck. (laughs) Your covering will show you the obstacles that will come in your road so that you also know how to handle them. It doesn't guarantee you're not going to have obstacles because you are. The obstacles definitely are going to come but you're gonna learn how to handle it because you have a covering with you, amen? Amen. And you're also protected under that covering. Number two, blessings, amen? Are y'all still with me? You get catapulted further in the things of God. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Proverbs 13 verse 22 says something amazing. Proverbs 13, 22. All right. It says this, a good man leaves an inheritance of more stability and goodness to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner finds its way eventually into the hands of the righteous for whom it was laid up. Right? A father lays up an inheritance for the children so that they can be catapulted further into the things of God. Bishop uh, put in his book, Cover Me in the Day of Battle, I went back to it again to read it again, and there was a particular page that I'm just going to read the first paragraph to us, okay? It says, in the kingdom of God, sons and daughters build on what their fathers have accomplished, then take it to the next level. An earthly kingdom wouldn't last long if there were no generational transfer within a royal family. In the same way, The kingdom of God should be building the future on the anointing of the last generation. It's a great book. If you've not read Cover Me in the Day of Battle, you definitely want to get that book. The inheritance of the generational transfer is a blessing to us that enables us to be able to do more. That's the blessings of, of serving man. Number three, you get a double portion anointing on your life. Amen. 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 And 2 Kings uh, chapter 2, verses 19 through 15. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 19 through 15. We hear about Elijah and Elisha, right? 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. And the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, inhabitant of this city is pleasant, 
as my Lord sees. But the water is bad and, and the locality, miscarriage and barrenness in all animals. Boom, boom, boom. I think it's First Kings, right? First Kings, oh boy, I did it. Don't you get mad at yourself when you make a, a mistake like that? Let's go to First Kings. Boom, 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 boom. Um, did I say verse? Oh, okay. You're in the you were in the wrong place. Second Kings chapter two verse nine. Did you do verse nine? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Peter messed up. Second Kings chapter two verse nine. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. All righty. Lord have mercy. Bless God. Hey, thank you so much, Angela. Golly, I know how she feels. I'm sorry. All right, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. And when they had gone over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. Come on. And Elisha prayed. Elisha said, I pray you, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. <laughs> what did Elijah say? Elijah in verse 10, what did he say? He said, you have asked a hard thing. However, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Verse 11. We're going to go all the way through verse uh, 15. As they still went on and talked, behold, a chariot of fire and horses of fire parted the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father. The chariot of Israel and its horsemen, and he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Verse 13. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And what did he do with it? Come on, verse 14. And he took the mantle that fell from Elijah and struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the waters, what happened? They parted this way and that, and Elisha went over. He said, my God, I'm bad. Verse 15. When the sons of the prophets who were watching at Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Let's keep it here. The spirit of God rests on Elisha. No, 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 no. You didn't listen to that. The spirit of who? Elijah. Elijah rested on Elisha. The spirit of Bishop Bart Pierce can rest upon us when we partake of the double portion anointing, when we get under that authority and under that leadership. Look at me and understand this. God has called you to, to accomplish a unique purpose, each and every one of you in here. It's not about being a copycat. That's not what God is after. But it is about learning the foundational truths that, they, that has been instilled inside of them to make you even better. It's about learning what they went through to make you even better. It's about uh, uh, operating in the anointing that God has bestowed upon them. That same grace can be measured upon you to make you even more dangerous for the kingdom of God. That is the benefit. That is the benefit of saying, you know what, I'm going to get under the set man and woman of the house or the leadership that God has placed you under. Amen. 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 Good God. Other examples, we won't read uh, the scriptures yet, but you've also got Paul and Timothy, right? Yeah. We've got Paul and Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 verse 2. You can write this down. You've got Eli and Samuel also as an example in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1 verse 24 through 28. And also again in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 3, the whole of chapter 3. You've also even got Naomi and Ruth. In Ruth chapter 1, uh, verses 16 through 18. Mm -hmm. These are people, and I'll tell you one thing about, uh, about Ruth that I loved. I loved what Ruth said. Ruth said, your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. We benefit, we benefit from the anointing that's in the set man and woman of this house. And I really feel that and the leadership also of this house, but I really feel that we need to understand why it's important to come under authority. It's really important that we come under authority because when we do that, 
you command those blessings that's going to form and shape your character, allow you to understand relationship, allow you to operate in the anointing, gives you that authority to do all those things. Amen? All right. Number four. I'm on three, right? So it's number four now, right? Number four. You benefit... You benefit from the relationships your covering has already established. Have you thought about this? Without Bishop Park Pierce, we wouldn't know Pastor Charles Green. When I thought about that, I was like, whoa. Because what got downloaded into us this past Sunday was phenomenal. But we got to benefit out of that because of the relationship that Bishop has with him. Without Bishop Bart Pierce, we wouldn't know Archbishop Duncan Williams. And the many prophets that he's brought that has ministered personally to many of us in this room, including myself. We wouldn't have RCCF, Rock City Church Fellowship. We wouldn't know of a Rock City Church in Madagascar. We wouldn't know of a Rock City Church in Ghana. We wouldn't know of a Rock City Church in Tanzania with Pastor Vincent. We wouldn't know Apostle Paul Tan. We wouldn't know Dr. Ed Tavos. We wouldn't know Evangelist Barboza. We wouldn't know Pastor Jim Kill Martin. There would be no Center City Church. We wouldn't have had this church if he hadn't said yes to being sent to Baltimore. And we get to benefit out of the relationships that the man of God has established. And you know, Bishop, whenever he leaves, he always leaves us with just great people that come and minister and bring a word. And we get that kind of benefit all by saying yes and being in this house. Amen? Amen. Also, you learn this amazing word called humility. You learn humility. Mm -hmm. I've learned humility through serving Bishop. And it's never been at the point of him trying to humiliate me. It's been at the point of me working on my character and him shaping and molding that for me. Humility, guys, is the best thing that we can walk in. Right. It's not about being seen. It's about serving and serving well. It's not about being seen. It's not about being in the public view. It's about serving and serving wholeheartedly. The purpose God is calling you to will make your flesh uncomfortable because pride has to be suppressed. And we can say just like Zechariah did in chapter 4, verse Four, verse 6, where he says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, of whom the all is a symbol, says the Lord of hosts. Amen? And in that learning humility, guys, because remember I talked about pride, right? Pride is an ugly demon. It is. It's an ugly demon. And it has to come out of each and every one of us. All right? And When you humble yourself, when you humble yourself, God can use you tremendously. And I've learned that even when I don't agree with what's being said, I understand that it's not my place to ever smite the shepherd. When I was in Bible school, and this isn't bishop, this is leadership. This isn't bishop. When I was in Bible school, There was somebody that was in leadership here, and I just could not stand that person. When I said I couldn't stand him, I couldn't stand him. I was like, I didn't like the style, I didn't like it. I was like, I don't even see where the word is fitting here. And I had a wrestling inside of me, because I was like, I know that what I'm hearing isn't accurate, right? But what do I do with that? Oh, I I know that I I just don't agree. What do I do with that? And I know I went to Pastor Darlene and I said, what do you do when you don't agree with what leadership says? And she said this that was very, very important to me. She gave me the picture of David and Saul. You know, Saul turned, turned again away from God, but God still had him as king of Israel. And Saul had the opportunity, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. David had the opportunity to take Saul's life in that cave. And he said, far be it from me to touch the Lord's anointed. Whoa. 
And that you'll find that in 1 Samuel 24, verse 6. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I do this to my master, the Lord's anointed, to put my hand out against him when he is the anointed of the Lord. This is a scripture that I've had to learn how to live with. Because just the way that we're designed, some of us, you know, I told you that God gave us a temperament, right? Mm -hmm. My temperament, I get mad quick. I do. Your boy don't like it when he gets irritated. When I'm irritated, it's not a good day for you, for me, or anyone around me. It's just bad. And so when I don't agree with something, I mean, me, I, I, I just suppressing my feelings is a very hard thing to do for someone that's of a choleric nature. It's just very hard. I was like, sometimes I'm like, good God, why am I hearing this? Right? Or sometimes I just want to say no. But as I'm saying, no, I say yes. <laughs> right? Because it's about humbling yourself. Right? It's about trusting the God inside of that person. 